behalf of excuse me, on behalf of Calvin College and the Paul V. Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics, I wish to welcome you to this evening's address. I'm Corwin Smith, the director of the Paul Henry Institute. The Paul Henry Institute for the Study of Christianity and Politics was created in 1997 to continue the work of integrating Christian faith and politics, an effort that was clearly evident in the life and work of educator and public servant Paul Henry. One of the activities of, it, of the Institute is its annual Paul Henry Lecture. Tonight marks the eighth such lecture. And we thank you for your interest in tonight's lecture and for your presence here. We trust that you will find the evening to be a stimulating and an enjoyable time together. For those of you who may wish to learn more about the Henry Institute and its efforts, there's a table in the lobby that has some brochures and newsletters that are free for your taking. If you would like to be informed of other forthcoming Henry events, uh, please let us know by signing up to receive such information. We want to thank you for your presence tonight and to uh, express our appreciation for your coming out. Uh, and we would like to acknowledge if there are any public servants in the audience tonight, uh, your presence here as well. I'm not certain if we have any tonight. Uh, but if there are uh, any who are currently serving in public office, uh, would you please uh, rise and just announce your, uh, where you're from and what office you hold? Is there anybody here tonight? Okay. Right. Uh, we also want to acknowledge the presence of Karen Henry Stokes and her husband James. Would you stand in there? And uh, I also see Steve and Mary Monsma. Steve was uh, a former public servant from this area, and we thank you for your presence. Steve actually delivered the annual uh, Paul Henry lecture uh, last year. So good to have you here. Two years ago, that's right. We do uh, a Democrat one year, a Republican another. So. <laughs> Steve was two years ago. <laughs> Uh, before I introduce tonight's speaker, would you please join with me in a word of prayer? Our gracious and sovereign God, we gather this evening seeking to be faithful servants in your kingdom work. We thank you for your faithfulness to us and for the mercy you have shown us. We acknowledge our dependence on you and we ask for your leading and direction as well as your insight and discernment as we endeavor to fulfill our public responsibility. We thank you for the life of Paul Henry, for his Christian convictions, his passion for justice. And we're grateful, too, for the work and witness of our speaker, the Reverend Dr. Bob Edgar. As you have instructed us, we pray for those who are entrusted to rule over us. We pray that you will provide them with discernment and wisdom as they confront the many complex and contentious issues that are brought before them. Enable them to balance rightfully and skillfully the demands of their principles and convictions with the needs to find solutions that can be achieved. We thank you that we live in a country where we're free to express our political opinions, where we have the right to assemble both religiously and politically, and where we are free to cast our votes for candidates for public office. We pray for the forthcoming election campaign. We pray for the health and safety of those campaigning for public office. We pray that those who seek to serve us may desire to seek your leading and direction in their lives. And we pray that those who are elected to serve us may do so humbly, honestly, and capably. We also pray for our world, and particularly this evening, for the Iraq and the Middle East situation. We pray for peace, and we pray that the legitimate desires and grievances of all involved may be addressed and met through a just and equitable solution. Bless us all to your service. Enable us, we pray, to be thoughtful and engaged citizens. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, following tonight's lecture, there will be an opportunity for questions and answers. And then at the conclusion of the discussion, 
you're all invited to attend the reception that will be held in the lower level of the auditorium. Now, it's a personal pleasure and honor for me to introduce tonight's speaker, the Reverend Dr. Bob Edgar. Dr. Edgar is General Secretary of the National Council of Churches in Christ in the United States of America, an office in which he has served since January 1st, 2000. A graduate of Lycoming College in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, he holds a Master of Divinity degree from the Theological School of Drew University. Dr. Edgar has had a wide-ranging career in which he has served the church and the public in a variety of noteworthy capacities. Dr. Edgar's service to the church has taken various forms. Ordained in the United Methodist Church, Dr. Edgar has served as a pastor in various United Methodist congregations, as a college chaplain, and between 1990 and 2000 as president of Claremont Theological School in Claremont, California. Dr. Edgar's public service has also been expressed in a variety of different forms. From 1975 to 1987, Dr. Edgar served for six terms in the U.S. House of Representatives, where he was the first Democrat in more than 120 years to be elected from the heavily Republican 7th Congressional District in Pennsylvania. His service demonstrated a bipartisan, ecumenical quality that has characterized both his life and ministry. Today, as General Secretary of the National Council of Churches, Dr. Edgar serves both the church and the public. The National Council of Churches is the leading organization in the United States in the movement for Christian unity. Its membership includes 36 different faith communities comprising approximately 50 million congregants. Together, the members of the council seek to forge, where possible, Christian unity and to serve churches and the people worldwide. Under Dr. Edgar's leadership, the National Council of Churches has uh, refocused its energies along two different lines. The first is a 10-year domestic mobilization to overcome poverty initiative. The other is an exploration of an expanded ecumenical vision for the new millennium, a conversation that has been expanded to include evangelical and Pentecostal churches, as well as the Roman Catholic Church. So Dr. Edgar is well qualified to deliver the 8th Annual Henry Lecture, The State of the World as Seen Through the Eyes of the Church. So please join with me in welcoming Bob Edgar to Calvin's campus and for his willingness to deliver this year's Henry Lecture. I really like that introduction. Do you want to try it one more time? <laughs> Let me just say a word of appreciation uh, to all of you for coming out tonight and for the establishment of the Paul Henry Institute. It seems to me that every church-related college, perhaps every college and university across this country ought to have an institute that studies the question of faith and the question of politics and how it blends. And I hope in my conversation with you tonight I'll be able to express a real effort and why I believe that we ought to have separation of church and state, but not separation of people of faith and institutions of government. So I commend you for having this institute and having this lecture series. Now, before I begin my lecture, I need your help because I have two really bad jokes that are stuck inside here, and I need your help getting them out. Um, before I share those two jokes, would you help me by moaning Going, oh. oh. You're going to need that for the first joke. Let's hear a little bit better. Oh. Uh, did you hear the story about this priest that was driving along in his car and had his best friend in the front seat? And he was driving, and they were talking, and they were going around this twisty, turny road. And uh, they came around a corner really fast, and unfortunately, they ran over a rabbit. They flattened the rabbit, completely flattened. It was a really sad thing. They pulled off to the side, and the priest and his friend got out, and they went over, and they started looking at this rabbit, and this rabbit was completely flattened. And the priest reached into his pocket, and he pulled out a flask, and he sprinkled it on the rabbit. And the rabbit jumped up, puffed up, ran about five yards and waved, ran about five yards and waved, 
ran about five yards and waved. And his friend said, wow, that must have been holy water. And the priest said, that wasn't holy water. That was hair tonic with a permanent wave. <laughs> That's one. <laughs> the second joke, is, you've heard the story about the mother mouse that's walking across the field, and she has behind her all her baby mice, all the little nieces, and she's just as proud as can be. And as she's walking across this field, it's a beautiful day, and she's got all the little ones behind her, and she's just so happy. Until you guessed it, a large cat came in the other direction, and the mother mouse got up on her haunches to protect the little ones, and she looks the cat in the eye, and she says, Bow wow! And the cat runs off. And the mother mouse turns to the little ones and says, Now you know the value of a second language. <laughs> I want to talk to you about a second language tonight, a, a language of blending your faith statement and your political awareness and activity. And I want to do it in a couple of ways. One is I want to tell you a little bit about my journey from being a pastor to being a politician. And then I want to tell you a little bit about where we are in the state of the world. And thirdly, I want to get to some specific issues about how I think our faith statements need to force us to wrestle with some issues of our time, issues that Many Christians are unwilling to stand up and speak out when others tell them to sit down and be silent, are unwilling to be clear and focused on a commitment to care for this fragile planet we call Earth. And then I'm going to stop and we're going to take your questions. But first, just a little bit about my journey. I grew up in suburban Philadelphia. I was the kid in high school that wasn't supposed to make it. I had a combined college board score of 730. I was one of the kids that joined everything, football, wrestling, track, was in the youth fellowship. I had everything on my resume you could think of you could join except an academic background. I can't remember ever reading a book until I graduated from high school. And my high school guidance counselor told me if I applied to college, I wouldn't get in. And if I got in, I'd flunk out. And he was almost right. I got turned down at almost every college. I got accepted at Kansas Wesleyan and at Lycoming College. Lycoming College in Williamsport because it took every pre-ministerial student that applied. It was in their chart. <laughs> and, and, and I thought, that's great. I got in to school. And there I was at age 18. I was an assistant in a church. And in college, I was in fraternity. And I was on the track team. And I was a cheerleader. I did everything you could do but study. I was an assistant pastor in a church in Williamsport, Pennsylvania, and I thought I was so smart that when my father told me that we were running out of money and unable to pay a second year in college, I called the bishop of the Methodist Church on the phone and said, uh, do you have any churches left over? Um, I think that I know enough because I've been an assistant for a year. Could you give me a church? The bishop and the district superintendent had, in the early 60s, more churches than they had seminary students and uh, retirees to handle these small little churches in the, in the rural areas. And so I was given to be pastor at the Gilbert United Methodist Church. I was two weeks, 19 years old when I became pastor of the church. I was only one year older than the kids in the youth fellowship. <laughs> my, my first baptism was a young lady, 78 years of age. I didn't know how to do it. I had a funeral before I had ever been to a funeral before. And yet, that beginning in the coal regions of Pennsylvania is the start of my blending of my faith and my political life. Uh, my sermons weren't very good. In fact, my girlfriend at the time would come to church to listen to me, and she would squirm when I got to eight minutes, because she knew my sermons would no, be no longer than nine minutes long. She's now been married to me for almost 40 years, and she now squirms when I'm about 35 to 40 minutes into a sermon. <laughs> but the people of that church taught me a lot. Here they owned only the inside of their houses. The coal company owned the outside, and when the coal company wanted to strip mine, they simply told them to get out. They leveled the houses, and they stripped mine the coal. The company owned the local store. So as a young person, I began to realize that 
We live in a world that's not often fair and not often equitable. The bishop thought I did such a great job the first year, he gave me two churches the second year. I served a circuit in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And by the time I had completed college, I had been serving for three years. And by the time I had completed seminary, I had been serving for six years. And yet in February of 1968, just before I was going to graduate from seminary, my education began. Now, a lot of you think that your education begins in college and graduate school, but my education began in February of 1968. I got an invitation by a chaplain at Yale University by the name of William Sloan Coffin. He invited a group of us to come to Washington to the New York Avenue Presbyterian Church to think about the Vietnam War. It's February 1968. Anybody who would even question the war was thought of as a unpatriotic, a communist. I decided to go, and I went to the church, and there were pickets out in front of the church. One of them was Carl McIntyre, the jury Falwell of that day, carrying a large sign that said, kill a commie for Christ's sake. I crossed the picket line, went into the church, went up onto the balcony, and uh, William Sloan Coffin was speaking, and there were other speaker after speaker thinking about war, thinking about the expenditures that that we make in weapon systems in those days. A young clergy person came down the aisle and came to the podium to speak. He's only 39 years of age. His name was Dr. Martin Luther King. And he came and spoke in such a way that you can imagine as a 22-year-old seminarian, my eyes just got bigger and bigger and bigger as he linked the poverty campaign and the anti-war effort, and what it would mean if we, in fact, invested in caring for the poor. Five weeks later, Dr. King was assassinated. Less than 10 years later, I was one of the 12 members of the Select Committee on Assassinations, looking into the death of Dr. Martin Luther King and John F. Kennedy as a member of the House Select Committee on Assassinations. I'm one of the few people in America who know more about the Kennedy and King assassinations than I'd like to know, but one of the few people has also interviewed the assassin, James Earl Ray. I like to dream of better than the assassin. Listen to some words of Dr. King, published in a book called Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community. If you have a chance, get that book out of the library and read it, and especially read the last paragraph of the book. It was published shortly after his death, and it repeated a theme of Dr. King's that I think is important. Here's what he said. We are now faced with the fact that tomorrow is today. In this unfolding conundrum of life and history, there is such a thing as being too late. Procrastination is still a thief of time. Life often leaves us bare, naked, and dejected with lost opportunity. The tide in the affairs of humanity does not remain at the flood. It ebbs. We may cry out desperately for time to pause in her passage. Time is deaf to every plea and rushes on. Over the bleached bones and jumbled residues of numerous civilizations are written the pathetic words, too late. He closes the paragraph by saying, we still have a choice today, nonviolent coexistence or violent co-annihilation. This may well be humankind's last chance to choose between chaos and community. Dr. King, even though I only met him once, walked with him through Arlington Cemetery in prayer for peace. Dr. King, only seeing him for that one time, but reading everything I could read, is my example of someone who took his faith and his public service and blended them at the right time, at the right moment, and changed history. Dr. King, for me, is my hero, is the person that I look to for inspiration and hope. I recognize that Dr. King didn't have a perfect life. He, he was not someone who every aspect of his life was perfection. But he reminds me of the Old Testament prophets. And he also reminds me of the New Testament disciples. If you look carefully at the Hebrew text and the Greek text, God doesn't pick the brightest and best. 
doesn't go after the PhDs necessarily. Average, ordinary, common people were called to be prophets and prophetic voices and disciples. They wouldn't be the people that we would have selected. But somehow, out of those ordinary people come the extraordinary visionaries that change the world in which we live. That uh, chance meeting, uh, I told an audience at lunch today that I feel a little bit like Forrest Gump. How many of you have seen the movie Forrest Gump? But remember how he stands next to everybody and he some by, by accident he's there when everything happens. There he is with Kennedy, there he is with King, there he is with Wallace, uh, there he is uh, in the Vietnam War, there he is. It, I'm that kind of a person in that I'm not the famous one, but I've often been next to some incredible experiences. I got elected to Congress uh, from the most Republican district in the nation to have a Democratic congressman. One year after looking the word Democrat, I come from the telephone book. I got mad at Richard Nixon and was helped by John Dean, Earl Lichtman, and Halderman to become a congressman. Uh, there I was in April of 1975, on the House floor on the 23rd of April, shutting the Vietnam War down, a war that I had opposed from 1968 on. It took 55,000 body bags to get us to an agreement that we should shut that war down. There I was in the midst of the energy crisis, and in March of 1975, uh, as a 31-year-old congressman, I, I decided that when the President of the United States invites you to the White House for breakfast, you go. And Jerry Ford invited the whole freshman class to come to the White House, and there I was. Uh, all the other members had come by car. I rode my bicycle to the White House to emphasize the importance of the energy crisis, and sat and listened to the president, talked with the president, and then suddenly when I got up and shook the president's hand, I looked down and my pant leg was still rolled up. <laughs> and by the way, they wouldn't let me drive my bicycle into the White House. All the cars got to go right up to the front gate. The bicycle had to stay at the outer gate because they didn't know what to do with it. I had an experience in 1977 where I decided to pay my own way to the Middle East. And I went to Israel for five days, and you couldn't fly between Israel and Egypt. So we went to Greece, and then we flew into Egypt, and Anwar Sadat invited my wife and I to come over to talk. I was a young congressman, and he wanted to know more about America. He was just changing his alliance from Russia to the United States. He said some interesting things. He said he wished the old woman was back, meaning Golda Meir. He said he disagreed with her, but he thought he could negotiate with her in a, in a positive way. Six months later, he climbs off his airplane in Tel Aviv and is greeted by Golda Meir with a kiss. And they sit together on a sofa and they talk to the camera about their grandchildren and you have some sense that Egypt and Israel might lead themselves towards Camp David and towards a peace agreement. Well, I'm just sharing these experiences to say you can move from being vice chairman of your son's parent-teachers organization to being a member of Congress in a pretty short period of time. And, and I was very fortunate to be one of the Watergate babies that arrived at a time where there were 75 Democrats and 17 Republicans, most of which cared about reform. Fewer of them were interested in being career politicians. Many wanted to be public servants. When you asked whether there were any uh, public servants in the room. I wanted all of you to raise your hand because we're all called to be public servants in the world in which we live. Uh, let me shift from telling more stories about myself to asking some questions about the state of our world. Alvin Toffler wrote a book a few years ago in the early 70s called Future Shock. How many of you remember it? it it's an interesting book. You don't have to read it all. You can read the first paragraph of every chapter, and you can skim through it and pick out a few little things, and you've got to make all the adjustments for the illustrations to today, but one illustration is stuck with me. Um, let me ask if there's anyone here who's 62 years of age. Your first name is? Jane? Jay. Jay. Jay is 62 years of age. Toffler said, listen, the world's been around for about 5 billion years. And Toffler had problems with five billion, so he said, let's just take the last 50,000 years of human existence, and let's take Jay's lifetime, 
And let's divide Jay's lifetime into the last 50,000 years of human existence. So you have one Jay on top of another Jay on top of another Jay, okay, just the average lifetime. What Toffler discovered is that 650 of Jay's lifetimes were lived in caves. Only in the last four lifetimes, Jay's lifetime, one other, one other, and one other, has anyone on planet Earth measured time with any precision? Only in the last two lifetimes, Jay's lifetime and one other of equal number, has anyone anywhere used oil or electricity? 95% of everything created by human hands has been created in Jay's lifetime. A group of librarians got together and said they had trouble with billions, and they wanted to understand the world in which we live. Some of you have heard this illustration. They said, let's suppose that there were only 100 people in the world, and everybody else disappeared. And suppose all 100 of them were in this room tonight. No one else existed. There were only 100 of us. But we represented ethnically, culturally, and gender-wise the nature of our planet. Who would be here in this room? What they discovered was that 52 of us would be women, 48 of us would be men. They discovered that 30 of us would be white, 70 of us would be non-white. They discovered that 30 of us would be Christian, 70 of us would be non-Christian, 57 of us would be Asians, 8 of us would be Africans, 14 of us would be from the North and South Western Hemisphere. And they discovered that six of us, one, two, three, four, five, six, would own one half of the world's wealth, and all six would live in the United States, not necessarily that six. <laughs> but here's what they also discovered. 80 of us, would live in substandard housing. 70 of us would be unable to read or write. And 50 of us, exactly half of the room, would go to bed tonight hungry. One of us would be near birth. One of us would be near death. One of us would have a college education. And not one of us would own a computer. We live in a world that's different than the world we see around us. We live in a world that is different in its complexity and in its texture. And it's in fact possible for you to go to high school, to college, to law school, to Congress, and not know what kind of world you live in. It, it's possible to get elected to the United States House of Rec Representatives and not be the brightest and best. Now, I'm sure Paul Henry was different than this, but. I met some other colleagues there when I was being sworn in, standing next to Peter Rodino and Morris Udall, when I looked around and discovered that the people who had their finger on the nuclear button were no brighter or dumber than I was, it was a revelation. It was a surprise. And, and we have a Congress of the United States that's not necessarily representative. 60% are white male, 60% are white male lawyers. Very few women, very few persons of color, very few people representing the ethnic, cultural texture of our world, and, and very few that really have the kind of international experience that Paul had, having served in the Peace Corps and other places, who, who understood the world, had a different worldview, a different world vision. I'll share one other illustration that I shared with a group of students, some of whom are, are here. You know that the Earth's been around for five billion years. How many people live here? Not the hundred, but how many physical people live on planet Earth? 6.3 billion people. It's an amazing number. The scientists tell us that after many years, hundreds of thousands of years, we reached one billion population on or about 1830, 30 years before the Civil War in the United States. 
One billion people living on planet Earth. That took many thousands of years, many millions of years, quite brilliant years. And yet, a hundred years later, in January, just shortly after the stock market crashed, in January of 1930, we had two billion brothers and sisters on planet Earth wanting access to clean air and clean water. And then just 30 years later, in January of 1960, when John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon were vying for the presidency, I was still in high school, we had three billion people on planet Earth. And then just 15 years later, when I was standing in the well of the house, there were four billion of us. I served six terms, 12 years, when the voters of Pennsylvania elected me to look for a new job, and we <laughs> lost the Senate race in Pennsylvania. I, I left Congress in January of 1987. There were five billion of us. The United Nations says, on or about October 15, 1999, just about when I decided to be General Secretary of the National Council of Churches, the population reached six billion people. What those numbers represent is this. More than one half of all the people who ever lived on planet Earth are alive today. As a person of faith, I put it this way. God has called us into a world that's different than the world we were born into. God has called us to a challenge to be disciples and prophets at a different time in history. And God has called us as people of faith who have read the Hebrew text and the Greek text to not only know that the disciples and the prophets were average, ordinary, common people, but also to recognize none of them ever took a vote or a poll to figure out what God's will is. And most of the disciples and early church leaders would be horrified at the fact that the Methodists are going to Pittsburgh this week to vote 1,800 to 2,000 times, yes or no, and they think that their decisions on questions as controversial as homosexuality or abortion are deciding God's will. Also, those prophets and those disciples never had a majority. Think about it. Look in the Old Testament and the New Testament. You can't find a time when they ever took a vote or they ever had a majority. God is calling us to be that prophetic voice at an important time in history. When I got elected to Congress, um, I only took the political skills I had known from the church, and they were pretty significant. If you've ever been to an annual conference of the Methodist Church, you know there's plenty of politics there. Uh, the difference between being general secretary of the National Council of Churches and being a member of Congress, a member of Congress is pretty easy. You only have the Democrats and Republicans and a few independents to worry about. As general secretary of the National Council of Churches, you've got 36 political parties to worry about. And you've got to get the Quakers and the Brethren and the Antiochian Orthodox and the Armenian Orthodox and the Greek Orthodox and the Methodist and the Episcopalians all to agree on direction for an institution. There's not a lot of difference between politics and religion in the sense that we all come to find and help address the issues of planet Earth. My personal belief is that my vocation as a minister and my vocation as a politician are in fact one. And there was no difference. I believed in the separation of church and state, but not the separation of people of faith and institution of government. But people would come to me as a clergy and they'd put a microphone in my, my face and say, don't you think we ought to have prayer in school? And I'd think for a moment and say, no, we don't need government to write prayers in school. As long as there are final exams, there will be prayer in school. <laughs> uh, reporters would say, are the Methodist Church going to control your votes? Today on CNN and on Fox News, they're asking John Kerry the same thing. This whole debate about whether John Kerry can take communion uh, because he has a position on abortion is a question that's of interest. It's not going to determine the outcome of the election one way or the other, but it's interesting how people are so afraid that church is going to somehow dominate their positions in government. 
But I gotta tell you, I don't want a Congress of the United States to be made up of people who completely disassociate from their faith. Because I believe that my faith statement, my understanding of the Old New Testament, the fabric of my understanding of God's will for me as a person, influenced heavily my work as a member of Congress. Not in the exact votes that I took. It's not as though all the votes are votes of conscience. They're votes of judgment. And they're rarely votes that are yes and no votes. Often they are blending of grays and shades of votes. Lots of times there would be a bill that would be 80% good and 20% bad, and you'd vote against it because the 20% bad was really bad. And other times there'd be bills that were 80% bad and 20% good, but the 20% good was so good, you supported the legislation. Rarely on the thousands of times that you get to vote yes or no are they votes of conscience or votes of judgment. The questions of conscience and judgment and morality come from the way in which you live your life, come from the texture about which you bring information in and process it through your mind and through your heart and make those judgment calls. And I guess my frustration is that we need to make some reforms of our political system in both the Democratic and Republican parties so that more people step forward to run for public office who re recognize that it is a public service and not a political service. Paul Henry was that kind of a Republican congressperson. And there are those persons in the House and Senate who reflect that personality. I have to tell you that when I got elected, we used to judge each other pretty harshly. And my best friend in Congress was Paul Simon of Illinois, who was one of your speakers here. And Paul would have done anything for public education. He would have given up his Senate seat if he could pass a public education bill and make sure that people understood the importance of public education. We would judge him very harshly if he didn't have that commitment to being willing to say, this is what I would give my seat up for if I could accomplish. And there were other <coughs> members, Republicans and Democrats, who had that personality and that passion. Paul was one of the best. God is calling us to this moment in history. I have shared what I believe is a state of the world. Let me get very specific. We live in a world not only that is exploding with population and consumerism, but we live in a world where the haves have and the have-nots do not. We live in a world where two-thirds of the world live on just a few dollars a day or less. And we live in a world that we often don't see in the kind of dramatic way that we need to see it. Uh, for example, the pandemic of AIDS in Africa, we put it out of sight and out of mind. Uh, that's one of the things I praise George Bush for, committing $15 billion to address the issue of AIDS in Africa. We, he's committed to that. I, I know, I, I said nice things about you. <laughs> We live in a world where we think military action can deter terrorism. We think that by bombing capitals we can get at terrorists. My own personal view is that there is terrorism in 60 countries. And we need to address it in several ways. One is we need to address it by having a police action, not a military action. We wouldn't have gotten the Oklahoma City bombers by bombing Oklahoma City, and we wouldn't have got the two snipers that were after Washington by bombing Washington. And, and I'm not sure that we lessen our number of terrorists by invading Iraq. We can talk about that in a question and answer period. Uh, but what I do know is we not only have to have a police action, we have to go with the systemic issues that cause the fertile ground around which terrorists live. And we here in the United States need to figure out how we can make a mid-course correction in our economic system so that it's not based on having a percentage of our people poor and a percentage of the world's population poor. We need to celebrate the fact that we've done away with slavery. We've done away with child abuse in the factories of the early 19th and 20th century. We've healed our society to some degree, and our percentage of poor has gotten to a 
fairly reasonable level, but we should not sleep until the nine million children who have no health care have some reasonable opportunity for quality of life. And we should not sleep until the 43.6 million Americans are on the health care roll. We should not sleep until we figure out a way to have a living wage, not a minimum wage. And we ought not to buy a 99 cent hamburger without recognizing that if we paid a dollar 15 or a dollar 25 for that hamburger, the person behind the counter could have a pension and health care. I, I think if we think carefully about it, those of us who are people of faith, we need to understand God's calling us to address the needs of the poor, asking us to care desperately, not just about our own well-being, but the well-being of others in our community. We ought not to have a public education system where if you're born in one side of a community, you get a bad education. If you're born in another, you get a good education. I represented suburban Philadelphia in Washington. The little city of Chester was in my district. It was ranked third in level of distress of all cities of its size. It was 75% African American and 75% Republican. The city of Chester was a city that was left out. They used to use Delaware County as the, the Mayor Daly Republican example of Mayor Daly Chicago, macing, patronage, uh, power politics. But it's interesting that every child born in the city of Chester the likelihood of them going to college was very slim because we based our funding of public education on property taxes. And yet there was a 50-yard bridge from Chester to the community of Wallingford, Nether Providence, and every child in Swarthmore, Nether Providence, and Wallingford went to college. And it was all based on the way in which we funded our public education system. God's calling us at this moment to look at some of these issues and try to figure them out, not as Democrats or Republicans, but just as how do we improve the quality of life on planet Earth for the least of these, our brothers and sisters, who live on the planet with us. I think God's calling us also to care about the environment. We got into a little trouble last week because a hundred of us signed a letter to the president complaining about changes in reg regulations on the Clean Air Act. And yet, most of us know that if we pollute our air and pollute our water, fail to respond to the oceans that are being depleted quickly, we are in trouble as a people and as a world. And so we sent a letter to the president urging the president to think more carefully about the issue of the environment. And it, these two issues, poverty and the environment, are two issues that Christians don't kill each other over, and two issues that Christians believe their colleagues in the Jewish and Muslim and other faith traditions can join together, care for the people, care for the planet. This is a different vision, I think, of, of the world that we're seeing, either in our current politics or in our international politics. And yet, I'm convinced that we can't wait for a majority of people to think this is a good idea to address the needs of the poor and to work on behalf of the environment or to seek nonviolent solutions to our situation of war. I believe God is calling us to be those prophetic voices today in a more powerful way than ever before. And you know the kind of prophets and disciples God's looking for are the kind of people who are in Calvin College, or are neighbors to Calvin College, or are sitting in this room. The fastest growing age group by percentage of population are those over the age of 100. The next fastest are those over the age of 85. None of us are going to be too old to engage in addressing the needs of this fragile planet we call Earth. And we need good people, Democrats, Republicans, and Independents, and others, to step forward and run for public office, run for public life. Public service is a valued contribution to our planet. Uh, public service is still a high value for us. And the challenges that we face need people who are smart like you are to help address these issues. 
I like what Bobby Kennedy said in South Africa in 1966. He said, let no one be discouraged by the belief that there is nothing that one man or one woman can do against the enormous array of the world's ills, against misery and ignorance and justice or violence. Few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events so that in the total of all those acts is written the history of our generation. I believe God's calling us to write the history of this generation, and it's, it's a blending of political service and human service. It's a recognition that all of us are called to be a prophetic voices, regardless of our faith traditions today, and to be courageous and speak truth to power, and to seek justice, and to seek peace, and to seek reconciliation and to seek brotherhood and sisterhood on this fragile planet. And those of you who might be uh, conservative religiously, I've heard all of us say that God has created each of us. That he's created the Christian children, and the Muslim children, and the Jewish children, and the Buddhist children. If God is the creator of all those children, then we must care for them all of the children on planet Earth. My favorite theologian is uh, Lily Tomlin. She did a one-woman show on Broadway. Uh, maybe some of you have seen it. It was written by Jane Wagner. It's called A Search for Intelligent Life in the Universe. And she plays all the parts, Lily Tomlin does, and um, she keeps all the information about intelligent life in the universe on these little yellow post-its, and she posts them all over her body. Uh, she comes out on the stage with a hat with an umbrella on it, playing the part of Trudy the Bag Lady. And Trudy the Bag Lady has been hired by two aliens from outer space to search for intelligent life. And she's standing at the corner of Walk, Don't Walk, waiting for the aliens. And she tells about her life, tells the fact that she's crazy, but she's happy with that. Everybody just thinks she's they're crazy, she knows it, there's comfort in knowing. <laughs> she tells lots of fun stories about herself, but she has been hired by these two aliens to search for intelligent life. At the end of the play, one of the aliens comes up to her and says, Trudy, before we go out to outer space, we need one more little piece of information. She looks down and says, what's that? We've searched for intelligent life. And the other alien looks up and says, Trudy, we want to know about goosebumps. She looks at the two aliens and says, you've come all the way from outer space, and the thing you want to take back to outer space as a gift are goosebumps. And then she remembers the last time she had goosebumps was in a Broadway play. So she takes the two aliens, and they walk over, and they go to a Broadway play, and they're standing in the back of the play. And uh, two-thirds of the way through the play, she looks down, and both aliens are completely covered with goosebumps. And then she notices that they're not watching the play at all. They're watching the human interaction. They're watching the people laugh and cry and the human emotion is what gave them goosebumps. And the final scene is Trudy out in the dark looking up into outer space and she says, you know, I think they're out there watching us. They see the inhumane things we do to each other and they see the funny things that we do. And she said, when, when they see us do those silly things to each other, I can hear them laughing. Most nights I come out here and I know they're watching us violate each other's human rights and civil rights, stay asleep in the face of Rwanda genocide and Sudan genocide and Cambodia genocide, and I can hear them crying. And then she says, someday, maybe you and I will do something so wonderful that it will give the whole universe goosebumps. My hope and prayer is that we will elect good people to public office, and we will create good public servants, and we will build a society that cares not just for those who happen to be Christian or white or comfortable, but we'll lift up intellectual mutants who will work to change the world in which we live so that the future for our children and grandchildren will be one of collaboration, 
not competition. Quality of life, not quantity of life. Care for the earth, not exploitation of the earth. Those are the goals that I think would give the whole universe response. Let me stop there and take your questions. You can ask questions about anything except for two bad jokes if you can. <laughs> questions. Your question, state your name and give your question. Uh, my name is Helen, Helen Stirk. And my question is um, um, kind of a personal one about you. Uh, I missed, as you were talking, your explanation of how you decided to run for office. Okay. You went from being a minister of these little tiny churches to running for office. Okay. Um, I was Protestant chaplain at Drexel University. I worked at a campus not unlike this one and uh, tried to have meetings, and not everybody showed up at the meetings I was trying to have. Uh, but I really got mad at Richard Nixon. And that's what got me from being a, an urban pastor and a campus minister to asking the question, could I find someone to run for Congress? Because the congressman who was representing me had been there a long time, was the best friend of Richard Nixon, and I was horrified that any president in the United States could fire someone who was investigating wrongdoing of that very president. And so when I asked the Democrats, they said that no one could win, we'll look for a lawyer who needed publicity because in those days, you couldn't advertise on television as a lawyer, so it was fun to run and lose and you had all this name recognition. But I have to say, my calling as a pastor was a calling to fix that which was broken in society. And in, the case, in my case, uh, on Friday and Saturday nights, I was riding with the Philadelphia Police clergy unit into high crime areas. And so I didn't have to prepare too many sermons because I saw them in the accident wards and in the police stations and in the illustrations of the streets of Philadelphia. Um, we discovered there were three shelters for homeless men, but no shelters that would take women and families. And when we tried to organize, people said it just couldn't be done. So we just simply opened our church in, right between Penn and Drexel. And in July of 1972, we created something called the People's Emergency Center. And we thought we would help 200 families over the course of that first year. 2,000 families came through the shelter. We thought the city would shut us down. The city came in and put showers in the church. This is 1972. The good news is we founded the shelter. The bad news is it's still open. So my trajectory was to be a pastor. But when the war in the Middle East occurred and the Jewish students were coming to me and asking, should we leave school to go and help in Israel? And when the, when the other students were challenged about the oil crisis and our dependence on oil, and then we had a, a White House that was trying to cover up the Watergate experience, I just got mad. And uh, I didn't have enough common sense to know I was supposed to lose the election. Uh, I announced my candidacy. I ran in the primary. And then I used the techniques of being a good pastor. I took a sabbatical from being chaplain. And I was everywhere for the days from July 15th to election day. And when I won by 19,000 votes, um, it was kind of interesting. Uh, my opponent, who was a lawyer and a district, a district attorney and popular, he thought the best way to win was to get a phone bank together and tell everybody, do you know I'm running against a minister? <laughs> Maybe you had to be there in 1974 uh, to know that a choice, this is before Jim Jones and Guiana, it's before Jim and Tammy Baker, it's before some of the scandals of, of Churchy folk, um, the choice between a lawyer and a minister. Uh, <laughs> I won by 19,000 votes that first time and surprised everybody. Uh, but again, that was not my miracle. The miracle was getting reelected. And, and I found myself discovering that being a politician was not unlike the vocation of being a pastor. Uh, church clergy have to use volunteers to get things done. Politicians have to use volunteers. Church pastors, if they're really good, care about the whole of the community, care about changing what's broken in the community. Politicians need to do that. 
And I think the reason I got reelected is I provided more service than the congressman who had been there before. Because it was a one-party county, he didn't have to work very hard. And so we had like the pastoral care office, uh, for example, when we appointed people to the academies, we didn't do it uh, politically. I set up a committee, we had a search committee, and people applied. And whoever the search committee thought should go to the military academies, that's who I supported. It wasn't a political decision, it was a decision based on the merit of who these individuals were. Um, it made sense to me. Uh, no other uh, congressman had ever had an office in the city of Chester, because that was the black city. I hired black staff, and we had an office in the city of Chester. And even though it was 75% Republican, it voted 75% for me. That's kind of fun. Other questions? Your question. Name and then question. Jay Van Bruggen. That seems a box was quoted recently, and I can't remember the exact quotation, but said basically that charity should be done by private individuals and that the government should stay out of charitable causes. Uh, I think I, I don't want to put words in her mouth. But I maybe maybe just quoted her a little bit, but I don't think very much. The question is, should government stay out of charity? Uh, should the private sector do all the charity and, and government stay out of it? Um, I disagree. Both Al Gore and George Bush talked about faith-based initiatives. Both Al Gore and George Bush, I think, think that moving towards a faith-based initiative, the best thing to do is to dump onto the religious community the charitable community to care for the poor and let the government care for military and social security but not care about social service uh, for, for the poor. Um, I know the person who's in the faith-based initiative office. He's a great person. His name is Jim Tui. He happens to be a disciple of Mother Teresa. He's Roman Catholic. I think he gets it. But I think a lot of the politicians who supported the faith-based initiative, thought of, of, it, it's a way of letting charitable things happen in the private sector, and, and they'll take care of the poor, and we'll just take care of other government service. What I believe is that it has to be a partnership between government, the private sector, and the charitable sector, and the religious sector. We need to work collaboratively and do what each can do well. Let me give you a specific illustration. I went to my friends at the Salvation Army. How many of you know the Salvation Army? I love the Salvation Army. Um, and I went to them, and we're talking about joining and building this new thing called Christian Churches Together in the United States. And the Salvation Army is evangelical enough that it becomes a bridge between the Evangelical Association and the National Council of Churches. And I sat down with the commissioner of the Salvation Army. He said, Bob, he said, I've got two really Difficult problems, I need your help with. I said, what are they? He said, since 1996, when, remember we moved from welfare to workfare? He said, half the people showing up at my homeless shelters and my food kitchens work full time. He said, we can't handle it all. We can't provide it all. And he said, we've been known as a charity, but we need to add the word advocacy and since 1996, he's been working not only with us, but with others to try to help government understand that it's got to be a partnership. He said another interesting thing. He said, we're creating all these evangelical churches around the country, and they're growing, and they're growing really great, except they don't want poor people to attend. And he said, that's outside of the mission of the Salvation Army. So he's using the word denomination for the first time as well. The point that I want to make is that I think it's got to be a partnership. I don't think that the private sector or the charitable sector can be relied on to address all the needs of the poor. There are some systemic things that have to happen. And I would argue fixing the brokenness of public education. On the 17th of May, we will celebrate the 50th anniversary of Brown versus Board of Education. And at that point, we overcame separate and unequal but we have still financially separate and financially unequal. We've got to solve that problem. We've got to solve the health care problem. And 
we got to work with groups like Habitat for Humanity and other government programs like Section 8 housing to solve some of the housing issues. And we also have to concern ourselves with the world that is living in such abject poverty. And I don't think you can just say to the charitable sector, fix it. I think you have to say government, private sector, business sector, charitable sector, religious sector, let's all work together. I'm on the board of something that you may not have heard of. You know about government. You know about the Chamber of Commerce. There's a new organization that you might want to get to know. It's called Independent Sector. And it's all the nonprofits in between. It's made up of a third of foundations and two thirds of uh, nonprofit organizations. And it's simply saying there is an independent sector between uh, business and government. And we need to figure out strategies to strengthen that independent sector. And then we all need to work together for the common good. Your question. Roger Hendricks. Uh, Roger. There seems to be some concern about the uh, United States having too large a share of the uh, world's wealth. Should we then be encouraging the outsourcing of work? The question is, should we be encouraging the outsourcing of work? The answer is yes. We should be encouraging the outsourcing of work. As long as the factories that are being established in other nations like Mexico have health standards, care for their workers, and we need to use our superpoweredness to make sure that health and safety standards and uh, due process is provided to those workers. My fear is that we've eliminated slavery here, but we've exported it there. We've eliminated child labor abuses here, but we've exported it there. We've eliminated health and safety issues at many of our factories and workplaces, but we've exported it there. And for the sake of profit and greed, we're willing to put a plant someplace where we can have cheap labor that is abused and reap the rewards financially of the coffee and the clothing and the other things that, that come our direction. So I think the answer to your question is, yeah, we ought to encourage outsourcing. The outsourcing is fine for other nations, but we need two things. One is to make sure those factories are healthy, and secondly, we need to make sure that the people who work here work in an environment where they get a living wage and not a minimum wage. I think the, the minimum wage issue is something that um, so many people take for granted because we don't want to hurt our small businesses who are making a profit. But we ought not to make that profit on the backs of, of the poor. And we ought to make sure that the person who works and gives service to, to us as a society has a living wage. Um, I'm, uh, I'm Laura Smith. I'm a Presbyterian minister. And I also think of myself as evangelical. And as an evangelical, I usually feel shut out for, from uh, ecumenical conversations. I, mm -hmm. I find I'm generally labeled as intolerant when I think I'm just making, just stating my faith. So, so don't be intolerant. Well, no. so, so uh, <laughs> yeah, so tell me how you're, you're uh, embracing evangelicals in the NCC. I think that's very exciting. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about that initiative? Yeah. Um, I took over the National Council when it was in financial distress. Um, and I was essentially bankrupt. And we struggled for a while. You saw us on television helping Elian Gonzalez, the little boy who was lost at sea. I flew to Cuba and brought the two grandmothers back, and uh, we got Elian back home. It wasn't until April of the year 2000, as the new general secretary, that I was able to get some of our leaders to sit down. And we brought in a consultant that I had known from California. And we spent a couple days together. And this one day, we were sitting with her, and one of the members had a revelation. And the revelation that this member had was that our vocation as leaders of the ecumenical movement was not to fix the National Council of Churches, but was to address the need of re-sparking, re-energizing the ecumenical movement. That was a catharsis moment, a revelationary uh, important moment. The second thing that came out of that same consultation was that we ought to narrow the focus of the National Council of Churches because everybody understood what Church World Service does. That's our humanitarian arm, that's prop law, 
that's easy to understand. That's helping poor unfortunate someplace. And everybody loved the church world service. Uh, church world service was in conflict with the rest of the council, and we had to kiss and make up and do all kinds of things that made both sides healthy. The church world service was there. But nobody could figure out what the mission of the rest of the council was. So we decided to focus that mission on four things. One was to build a larger ecumenical table and to invite not only the Roman Catholics and the Salvation Army, but those evangelicals who have read the Bible literally enough to discover God cares about poor people, and those evangelicals who have been locked out of being part of the, the existing National Council, because in the Evangelical Association, in their bylaws it says, you can't belong to the Evangelical Association if you're a member of the National Council of Churches. And you'll be interested that it was the Reformed Church in America that tried to break that deadlock. It was Wes Granberg Michelson who went to uh, the evangelical group and said, take that out of your constitution and we'll become members of both. He got the president of the Evangelical Association fired because the president thought it was a good idea. <laughs> but we did not stop. We went and talked with evangelicals who had not been part of our group, had been part of the other. And we started a series of stealth secret meetings. The first one occurred in Baltimore under the guidance of Cardinal Bill Keeler, the ecumenical cardinal of the Roman Catholic Church. That actually happened on the 9th of September, a couple days before 9-11. That was the first meeting. We then met uh, the next spring in Chicago. We then met in Pasadena. We then met in Houston. And by next April, we'll create this new entity. And let me use this illustration. Uh, some of you know that the ecumenical uh, movement has been uh, visualized by a ship. The new vision is a spaceship. And our discovery is that if Russians and the United States can, in fact, work together in a common space, maybe Christians can build a spaceship large enough that we all can fit in, and maybe God's spirit can exist. And there will be docking stations to that spaceship that will not only have church world service, but also world vision, Catholic charities, uh, other agencies. And it will have a place for the National Council of Churches to dock and a place for the evangelical to dock, it will be a larger table. And it will be created not by the National Council of Churches, even though we stimulated the early conversation. It's got to be created by the churches themselves because it's got to be owned by them. So the Presbyterians and the uh, Reformed uh, Christians and the Methodists and the Greek Orthodox and Armenian Orthodox and Russian Orthodox and Martomas and Swedenborgians and all the other varieties of Christianity that we have have been in conversation voting to create this new entity. I once thought that once this big new spaceship was created, the National Council of Churches could go out of business. But what I've come to discover is that we are able, because of our 55 years of history and standing for civil rights and human rights and people's rights, to take some uh, positions that this larger body couldn't take because its theology is so broad. So my guess is there'll still be a satellite group, maybe not as large as the current National Council of Churches, but made up of those people who want to work together on poverty, want to work together on environment, want to work together on peace and justice, but who won't be afraid to stand at the the sidewalk in front of the Supreme Court and advocate on behalf of the Guantanamo detainees, who won't be afraid to speak up for those persons who are immigrants and refugees, uh, that kind of a group. There's going to be a third ecumenical body as well. You'll have the larger Christian churches together in the United States. You'll have the National Council of Churches. And then you'll have a smaller group, which includes Presbyterians, of something called Christian Churches Uniting, and there are only nine denominations in that group. And that's the old COCU conversation. They're focused now on the issue of racism. And the unique thing about those nine denominations, they can break each other's bread and take each other's communion. And just to tell you how hard it is, we have 13 Orthodox traditions in the National Council of Churches 
Many of you think of us as a liberal organization, but I gotta tell you, we've got 15 of our 36 member communities that don't ordain women. And it, it's hard to say the Syrian Orthodox or the Armenian Orthodox would be thought of as a liberal. Now, they don't take each other's communion inside the Eastern and Oriental Orthodox tradition. And there's been a big argument, conversation in the World Council of Churches, they don't want to worship. They're willing to pray with other Christians, but the idea of actually worshiping, using the word worship, is a, a, a barrier. Uh, they, in many cases, have their feet firmly planted in the ninth century, have not gone through a reformation yet. Uh, they're very good people, delightful to work with, but there are still barriers to our finding ourselves one. In 1950, when the Federal Council of Churches evolved into the National Council of Churches, the goal was to, uh, to understand our mission as to become one in Christ, to find unity in Christ. I think that's our goal, but our practical application is to find community first. To figure out while we're moving towards unity, let's figure out community. And so this larger entity will help us do that in its three or four different uh, manifestations. Your question. Steve Moss was my name. And, uh, you know, at various points tonight, you made clear that you believe public officials ought not to divorce their Christian faith from their actions and their votes. And mm -hmm. I certainly agree with that. Or Jewish people from their faith, or okay. Muslims from theirs. Okay. Uh, but I suspect that persons such as Jerry Falwell or uh, Pat Robertson, maybe Tom DeLay were here tonight, they, they would agree <laughs> with that. You know, I that. Uh, that they would Jerry Falwell didn't. Uh, Franklin Graham didn't. Pat Robertson didn't. Tom DeLay did. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. No. Uh, that that they, they would agree with that basic proposition they Forward. Mm -hmm. But yet, obviously, they are reaching different public policy positions on that basis than what than what you reach. Mm -hmm. So my question is uh, that there must be something additional or more, a different perspective that you and they bring to the table to reach such different conclusions. And I was wondering what your thoughts would be on what that something different or that something more is. Let me just say, I, I, I hope that liberal Christians and conservative Christians have a base of knowledge and sharing of information that will open some ears to listen and some hearts and minds to be open to learning some new thoughts. That is my prayer. My reality has been that there has been a gulf between two communities of Christians. Let me describe them. I get into trouble when I describe them, but I'm going to describe them because this is Calvin College and you don't mind a little controversy. Um, <laughs> there is one way of reading the Bible as Christians that reads the Bible through the book of Revelations, looks at the Old Testament in some specific ways, and sees God as a God who's going to send a Messiah to choose between the good and the evil, the good ones and the bad ones, who talks a lot about Armageddon and talks a lot about the second coming, and has built a faith tradition which is very important and earnest in their minds in terms of Jesus being important but that the message of Jesus is that Jesus is going to come again, probably around Israel or Jerusalem. There's going to be an Armageddon, a second coming, and the good folks are going to go to heaven and the bad folks are going to go to hell. That's the simplistic translation of the one community of Christians. There's another community of Christians who reads the Bible in a different sense is surprised by Jesus because Jesus doesn't come as the leader of a mighty army separating. Jesus comes saying, blessed are the peacemakers, uh, 
love your enemy, love your neighbor as yourself, what you've done to the least of these, our brothers and sisters. And this community of Christians um, believes that perhaps the second coming is in two respects. One is that it's already happened. It's called Easter. The Holy Spirit is already available to us. And it comes as a second coming when we re realize that God's presence is with us. And this community of Christians, and again, this is simplistic, believes that God is calling us not so much to worry about whether we're going to heaven, but worrying about whether or not we can live as brothers and sisters on planet Earth. And so we've got these two tensions, both believing that they have been inspired by God to understand their worldview, both claiming a Christ-centered life, and the good news is that many evangelicals, particularly those that we're working with to form this new organization, have discovered in relationship that liberals actually pray and that liberals actually have a spirituality. And some of the liberal denominations, like the United Church of Christ and others, have actually discovered that evangelicals and religious right have a social compassion and care about AIDS, care about the poor, care about those in need. And I would argue that, that both of us, both camps are wrong and that we have not done enough to build bridges together. Uh, there are some people helping to build bridges. People like Tony Campolo, of, uh, who's an evangelical. And Tony Campolo got up in front of a group, just like you, thousand evangelicals, and he said, you, don't give a shit about the poor. <laughs> you imagine what that did with this evangelical audience. And then he said, I bet you're more concerned about the fact that I used the word shit <laughs> than you are about the poor. He also came before, as an evangelical, he had the National Council of Churches, and those liberal folks, and the Presbyterian, and Methodist, and Anglican Church is standing and applauding. He got up in front of him and he said, I'm often asked whether I speak in tongues. He said, I don't even, I don't speak in tongues, I don't even kiss in tongues. <laughs> but he was clear in trying to bridge a commitment uh, from his evangelical position. Uh, for example, he is an excellent spokesperson on AIDS and an excellent spokesperson on inclusiveness. And yet he comes from an evangelical Jim Wallace is the same, Ron Sider is the same. Uh, you could name a whole host of, of people who can't be labeled either uh, totally to the right or totally to the left. I think those of us who tend to be middle to left uh, need to be more uh, willing to be compassionate and caring. And my hope is that we can build some bridges with each other in this larger relational body so that we stop labeling each other and I have to ask God's forgiveness because I'm always using the shorthand of, uh, of labeling, and that's one of my uh, worst sins. Thank you for asking. Me. One more question, Edgar. Okay, Edgar. My name is Chico Daniels, and I run a rescue mission here in the city. Uh, the name Chico is a misnomer. I'm actually African American. Been here this community now about three years, long enough to be told that this is a Dutch town and there aren't any Dutch here named Chico. <laughs> <laughs> I've also witnessed the racial division in our city over the controversy whether a street ought to be named after Martin Luther King Jr. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> the racial division or chasm that that caused in this city, or at least revealed in this city, and I went to the mayor and I, I spoke to him about a, starting a, a mayor's commission on reconciliation. And he and I were talking about what would it take to get the white community to the table. And, uh, you know, the governor has got this initiative right now going about cool cities. And we, we both agree that racism doesn't make a, a city cool. And yet we are... It makes it cold, but not cold. Makes it cold. And yet we're struggling with the idea of what what is the carrot to, that would get the whites to the table to talk
talk about racial reconciliation and healing, something patterned after you know, what South Africa has uh, done. And uh, that's the dilemma. And I, I'd like to ask you to help me with that because I, I want to talk to the mayor again, who is a minister, by the way, and uh, just want to continue this dialogue of what it's going to take to get the white community to the table. Let me say two things. Racism is a plague that still exists in our world. Amen. We may have had a majority to support the Voting Rights Act for about a day and a half. And Dr. King, I think, helped with whites and blacks and others, including the National Council and others, to move the nation from a segregationist nation to a nation of at least a little more tolerance. But we haven't healed the racial divide. We saw it just after 9-11, where persons of Middle Eastern descent and who looked a little blacker than others uh, were picked out and charged and in some cases attacked and killed because they looked different. And I think racism is the big elephant in the room that's under the surface of much of our uh, time together. Um, the second point I want to make is how do you go from the here to there? Um, Dr. Jonas Saw came before a group of us in the House, Democrats and Republicans, and uh, he talked about the polio vaccine, and he talked about uh, one world view and another world view, and we asked him, how do you get from an old world view of competition to cooperation to, to, to move away from things like racism? And he said, in every change in human history, there have been a mutation. And what we need today are some intellectual mutants who actually then can bridge old world view and new world view. And so using Dr. Salk's idea, you know what I think is that maybe you need to start small. Uh, maybe you ought to find the 12 people in this community. Jesus liked the number 12. Uh, one of them didn't work out so well. But uh, find 11 people in this community who will sit down and think with you and pray with you and argue with you about racism. And then draw your circle a little wider and find other ways to address the issue, and perhaps use uh, a technique that I was taught by uh, Millard Fuller of Habitat for Humanity. He said, if you really want to get blacks and whites to think together, uh, get 10 black persons and 10 white persons to build a house together. Uh, put all the materials together and let them build that house together. And at the end of building the house, they will have had the best conversation about racism and about injustice in society, as you can imagine. And maybe finding a way other than simply a commission that would sit and do the, the truth hearing, which needs to happen, maybe a first step is find the equivalent of building a house together. Uh, a young guy in, in Washington watching Habitat for Humanity invented something called Kaboom. You know what Kaboom is? Kaboom is the same as Habitat for Humanity. It goes into neighborhoods, and in one day, constructs a playground. It finds the neighborhood, finds the one that needs a playground, uh, makes all the arrangements, goes to Home Depot and the other uh, uh, things, gets volunteers, gets the wood, and on one day, kaboom. Uh, what about kabooming with blacks and whites uh, working together on that? Uh, I think racism is a tough thing to deal with, and it's not something that ended in 1964. It's something that needs to be continually worked on. And my guess is that part of our foreign policy as a nation has a lot of racism in it. Why is it that we responded to Kosovo but not to Rwanda? Why is it that we've let the pandemic of AIDS get out of hand in Africa? If that had happened uh, in other places, would we have been so slow to respond? Uh, I think we as a nation have a lot of asking forgiveness uh, for what we do internationally. I think here in this community, start small, find a project, do it together, um, spread it out, get others to do it. Uh, I think you can change the nature of the conversation. I'd like to close with a benediction. And uh, would you mind standing and holding each other's hands? I know that people here in this community don't like to touch. <laughs> Thank you.
all I need to do is hold each other's hands for a moment. It's only take a, a second or two, touch each other. Uh, I want you to think about um, the world in which we live and about the nation in which we live. Uh, as we touch each other, we don't know whether we're Democrats or Republicans or Independents, Conservatives or Liberals. As we hold each other, I want us to listen to these words. It's a Franciscan benediction, but I think it speaks to the issue of the state of the world as seen through the eyes of the church or the state of the church as seen through the eyes of the world. So this prayer goes like this. Let's pray with our eyes open and our hands held together. May God bless you with discomfort at easy answers, half-truths, and superficial relationships so that you may live deep within your heart. May God bless you with anger at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that you may work for justice, freedom, and peace. May God bless you with tears to shed for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and war, so that you may reach out your hand to comfort them and turn their pain into joy. And may God bless you with enough foolishness to believe that you can make a difference in this world so that you can do what others claim cannot be done. Amen. <laughs>